This is Twit. I have a... I have a duty to alert people that my husband works for Activision and my brother works at Blizzard. Wow. So, yeah. It's Most all in the family. Person yeah. ever. I can't, I cannot comment. Uh, I don't I, like, I mean, I've talked about it on, on Twitter. So like, I, I don't. What does your husband about, do? I don't have any official comments. What does he do com- at Activision? Comments. Is he a designer? He, is he a lawyer? What is he? No, this? he's a, he does logistics for all of their esports. So oh, that's he does, cool. uh, he makes sure that all of the, it basically like my husband is one of the linchpins that ensures all items, products, jerseys, computers, webcam, like literally all equipment gets to its destination and, and the events happen the way they're supposed so to happen. What's so what's the prognosis that's, that's what for esports? Because I've thought for a long time that's the next big thing. And then all of of a sudden it seems to be collapsing in on itself esports is really hard i think i think a lot of people saw what was happening in south korea and really got excited in in you know starcraft and uh you know league of legends and a lot of that in south korea is just you know there's a very different there's a very different culture around esports and you know for me like kind of non-exclusive to what's Activision or Blizzard, just esports in general. I think one of the hardest things is is that you know we don't really have. Um, I've always wondered why we don't have home teams that have like arenas like that. The, we don't have a place for fans to go to. It's always like oh they're going to play like in LA. It's like oh they'll play at you know Microsoft Theater or they'll right. they'll play here or whatever. But it's like there there should be like a location that is the teams stadium as it were it doesn't have to be huge and that's the place where fans can come for signings and they can come for you know press press events and they can sell merch there and they can meet the players and like learn about them more and one of the things we have in other sports that we you know that are very niche in esports i think to a degree is superstars that are known outside of the sport itself so it's like a lot of people know a lot of uh, football NFL players, even though they never have watched a football game. Like, oh, I've seen Michael Strahan yeah. on uh, yeah, yeah. live they're with uh, Kelly and, and yeah. Michael. It's like yeah. they're celebrities. And the yeah. thing is, is I think that there's a real difficulty in one. A lot of these kids are kids. They're 18 and they are, you know, they're not great at talking on camera. They're not good at reading a teleprompter. They're not good at being a spokesperson. They're just used to being in, at their desk and streaming and they're really good at it. Like they're really good at it, but that doesn't necessarily translate to a successful career as a, as a, as a celebrity or a personality, a bigger personality. And I think really they, there's a, there's kind of a, a disconnect there between like, you have to kind of create a superstar in some ways, but also it's that lightning in a bottle where you have to find the right person. So I don't know that they've really found that formula yet. And, um, and also you have to really, the most successful esports teams have super dedicated fan bases locally. If you look at like Houston outlaws for overwatch, like they have a massively dedicated fan base. They love them. They love that team. And they will, they, like, their fans are crazy about the team. They follow them. It's it's all the same things you see in other professional sports leagues. But the thing is, is, like, it doesn't happen with every team. What is, so what's hard. it going to take? How do we, how do we fix that? Um, I suppose Starcraft 3. <laughs> Starcraft 3. I suppose it is yeah. a, um, uh, a maturing process where you get the esports athletes to become more, camera ready you know maybe they hire a uh, rowdy skeleton but they get them more <laughs> yes you know i look at uh alex and i are formula one fanatics what turned that on around in the u.s was uh the netflix show uh, drive, to, drive survive, to survive great show amazing loaded f1 in the u.s yep uh and i don't know if it's intentional or not but f1 seems to choose its drivers not just for their ability to drive, clearly they've got to have that, but because but they're all damn fine looking people with with pretty good personas on camera, right? Right, right. Well, you pick the people who are interesting, right? It's it's the same model as Real Housewives. It's I mean, it literally is, which is like you're following a group of people who are forced to interact with each other right. over a season, and there's a act, there's an air of competitiveness to Do it. Do we need that? Do we need a, um, a reality show based on an esports team? To Hi, so uh, this is Benito, by the way. Benito, our Oh, my our, God, Benito, our, get our in here. Director. I was an esports journalist for like three years, and I, I ran the you Tell us, Benito. I ran all the esports coverage at GameSpot for a couple of years. So 
the problem with esports is the stigma attached to it in America. That's really it. They're like, nerdy. At, at that's the time, a big, yeah, that's a big one time, too. That's when esports was, when I was covering it, esports was t- about to take off, was like starting to do its take off. I was trying to be like on the vanguard of that. And what I noticed is that people are really willing to drop a lot of money if there's only, only if there's a promise of a lot of money. And like, well, yeah. and that's exactly what happened in the esports yeah. business. People dropped a ton of money. Look at this guy, disguised toast who uh, created an esports team. He says, it cost me a million dollars. It's a terrible business. Everyone's losing a lot of money. Um, he created a team for Valorant Pro called DSG and lost just a ton of money. Um, but it's like, who's talking about Valorant? Like, yeah, maybe I, that like, was a I mistake, genuinely have huh? these questions. It's just like, I don't, I don't know anybody. I know people who play Valorant and it's a, it's a perfectly fine game. I don't know anybody who's like so hype about it that it's their entire personality. The way that I literally know people whose entire personality is a football team. Well, it's uh, also a matter of time. Like football. I'm, I'm enjoying watching years. Alex because he no, doesn't realize true. That's true, he's Benito. muted his mic, so he he hasn't been able to get no. a word edgewise on this whole thing, and he is he is champing at the bit. If I might use, I, I have been a phrase allowed from an older comment. sport. Yes. What's your thoughts, Alex? So, As a Dota I'm 2 a, fan. No, no, actually not at all. Um, <laughs> I, I've said this before, I think, on Twitter, but like when I was a child, I used to drive to my parents' office because they had faster internet so I could watch Korean language uh, VODs of Brood War games that were uploaded to YouTube because there wasn't Twitch at that time. Right. So I, I'm a, I'm a, I am politely an esports OG in the sense that I've really cared about it for a long time. I think the problem was there was a period of rapid growth with things like the League of Legends pro scene. And then people got a little bit ahead of themselves on the revenue potential, put more money into it than it could sustain. And now we are dealing with a pretty standard business hangover. Is that um, true, Benito? Would market. you say that's I'd that's say that's fair. 100% accurate. Yeah. Like, um, Post, the, same as the pandemic. Yep. Same as companies saying this is the new normal, this right. is the new baseline, right. and, and it wasn't. There it wasn't crash. at all. It was just a. It was crash, an anomaly, bang, and yeah. people people overinvested. And by the way, yeah, it was just overinflated. Historically, that seems to always happen. I think back to the railroad boom when we had a cro- when they finally built a cross country railroad in the United States. All the railroads of that time went bankrupt. But what we got out of it was the infrastructure so a whole new generation of railroads could emerge. Mm. And the same thing they say happened in the tech bust at the end of the last century. There was an overbuild of fiber because everybody was so yes. bullish in the late 90s that dot-com was going to rule the world. They, there was the dot-com bust, but we still have all of that fiber. And so I think that's a normal business cycle. Alex, you kind of follow the business cycle. I think that's yeah. accurate, yeah? I think that's true in a lot of a lot of say, cases when we're talking about physical infrastructure. Like there was a canal building boom in in the in Britain back in the day, right? Um, the difference with esports though is it's pretty digital, and so there's less of an asset. There's no infrastructure at all. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, unless you're talking about arenas, is doing physical things, but it's not quite the same quite the same substance. I think also it's just it's too advertising driven a product right now, even though they did manage to bring in blue chip um, sponsors like if you watch League of Legends pro scene, you'll see Visa logos and other big names. And that's great. And, and shout out to them. Um, but it's not going to be growing as much as people thought it might a couple of years ago. And so people are dealing with the the pain of overinvestment. But at the same time, compared to what there was when I was. 15, 14, like the modern esports scene is so incredible. So sure, it's not going to take over the NFL or the NHL in the next couple of years, but there's still so much going on that me, yeah. someone who never thought this would happen because no one else cared when I was a kiddo, um, modern people that are fans have so much more. I'm just excited about that. So to me, I'm measuring from the bottom up, yeah. not from the top down on this. Think one. about Dungeons and Dragons which for a very long time was considered incredibly uncool, the foundation, but the foundations were there. And then it just took a few big hits like Critical Role and Stranger Things and everything to bring it back to the zeitgeist and, and make it part of like popular culture and make it cool. And then all of a sudden, like that was the thing. So it's to me, it's it's a long game. I mean, and I also can I also share my bona fides. I was a I was a professional Unreal Tournament 2003 player back in like oh four, I think oh four. I was like signed with the Global Gaming League and I got to open for Jane's Addiction in Cleveland. So that was my claim. That's my that's my esports claim to fame. I used to play esports before esports was esports. I believe there is a video of you 
Uh, I hope to God there is not. On stage <laughs> at the uh, concert. Leo, there must there must never, I have thought this was scrubbed from the internet. I didn't, because this was before you, this is pre-YouTube, so yeah, I hope yeah, there yeah, isn't. Yeah. Oh my God, no. I was a um, uh, Quake 3 person more than an Unreal Tournament person. Ah, uh, yes. we. I think we played with the Quake, the Quake guys, because I remember uh, So Crates specifically like i remember a feel like a handful of guys yeah. that we hung out with all the time yeah yeah and then who was um fatality of course was one of the fatality early, like, yeah like really early kind of esports money. yeah esports uh influencer slash uh early adopter of esports scene like he was yeah. i think he was like probably the most famous esports person here is pre uh, league of legends here pre, is yeah pre West. pre yes. like in the before time like from, in the early phases of esports. From an, from yes. Instagram, here is Ashley playing. Uh, yeah, there's Unreal me playing with a, in front Unreal of with a crowd of a bajillion people. Jane's addiction. And what type of computer a, is that? On a lime that's green. A, that's an Alienware. Alienware. The lime green <laughs> Alienware uh, yes. laptop. You love I, to see it. You love to see it. I have my lip gloss stuffed in my in my skirt right there because I didn't in have your pockets. Denim, your denim mini. My skirt. denim mini. That's man, early two thousands, wild time. And I like, Park is still blowing up. It's a good time to be alive. I, and I, and I like, like she's, she's wearing a, a wrist a towel uh, on her wrist because, you know, you don't want sweat on the mouse. No. Nope. And uh, no, wow. no, that's a wrist It was guard. extremely humid. Yeah, yeah, it was a wrist guard, but also it was extremely humid in Cleveland. I will say Dave Navarro was really nice to us and he was like very fascinated by esports. That was that he was like asking us a lot of questions about it, which was super weird. I just want to say there's one more aspect to this that no one talks about. Benita, that, um, yes. These games are owned by companies. Nobody owns basketball, nobody owns football, nobody owns hockey. Very true. Yeah. Well, and look what happened to the Mario was it the Mario tour. Um yeah, you get they uh, people who were throwing up Smash tournaments got S cut off by Nintendo. Nintendo so like, cut happened. off the Smash tours. Like yeah. the NBA isn't going to come in and stop somebody's basketball game. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Here's the story from uh, last uh, November: Nintendo shuts down Smash World Tour without any warning. Organizers say they'll lose hundreds of thousands of dollars. They thought Nintendo was happy. Uh, with this tour and it was very good they weren't using mods or anything it was a very good ad for uh, Smash Brothers or whatever they call that yeah. game Super Smash Brothers um, but Nintendo decided and this was comp there was a whole bunch of complicated stuff going on with this it wasn't just Nintendo unilaterally deciding there were competitors and so forth um, didn't end yeah. well didn't end well and so that's part of the problem too I still feel like in my lifetime, this is going to happen. And I'm yeah. not going to live much longer, so it's going to happen pretty... <laughs> it's coming soon. Leo, you pretend to be like 97 years old, but <laughs> you're might. still not. Let me tell you well, something. Well, you were talking about the railroads, and I was like, what were you, Leo? Like five or six when that happened? I nailed the golden spike myself. <laughs> yes. uh, we played... When uh, Unreal Tournament came out on the set of the screensavers back in 19, whatever, it was 99 or something. Oh, man. We built the ultimate what gaming machine. What a great machine, game. And we played it like crazy. We loved that it's game. It's a really fun game, Unreal Tournament. The rocket launcher rocket was just launcher. so satisfying. Yeah. And the flat cannon was also like a very satisfyingly designed weapon. But we would play the rocket launcher only level. And that oh, was that, so that's much very fun. fun. Yeah. That's that was very fun. So much fun. You know, you know what I miss about games in that era is that they were really, really simple. So, like, I played a lot of Destiny and Destiny Two, and like, I, I got, I gotta say, it's too complicated. Great game. No, but, but it is. Just, I agree with you. There's so much. There's too many there's a lot. dials and knobs and buttons. Give me a rocket yeah. launcher <laughs> and like somebody over there. That's all I need. And a castle, yeah. and I'll run around. If some, if, we're showing our age. Right yeah. now. If you locked me in a room and said, Alex, you can only invite four friends over. You're playing Quake 3, Q3 DM6 is the map. And yeah. that's all you have to do. And here's this 12 Done. pack of soda. I would have the best night Done. of my life. And I think that actually hurts esports because <laughs> you can't just pick up and watch League of Legends and understand. I mean, you really have to. There Now, yeah. maybe I'm wrong on that because I have to say there are. You know, football's pretty complicated. Cricket's pretty complicated. Yeah. And they're massive audiences for these games. But I feel like. But those have institutional support. They right? have like, institutional support. Right. Yeah, it has you grow, and you also, grow up think, learning yeah, baseball, grow, right? Yeah. Right. You, you grow. And there are some, I mean, I think there are some initiatives um, they have that are out there that are like, you know, esports in high schools and stuff now, which I, like I'm seeing more of that. There's a, that's becoming more prevalent. Let me um, take like, a break because I, I, 
I would like yeah. this conversation. We've got some gamers here. Benito, thank you for chiming in. Please continue to do so. Yes. Uh, I forgot that you covered esports for all those Get years. Get it, Benito. Benito's awesome. Benito runs our board uh, for the show and is one of our best editors and uh, and tech guys. He's, he's a do-it-all studio guy. You worked yeah, at Twitch you. before this, right? Yeah, right before this I worked at Twitch. Yeah. Uh, we got to get the Benito cam going. Did you turn yes. off, yeah. you turn off the lights? The lights there lights used to be lights and cameras back there. I think Benito's shy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what, actually, you're one of our, I think you might be our second newest. Viva's newer than you. Viva but, and Ty. And Ty, that's right. So you're, you're pretty pretty new here, but boy, we love having you here. This episode of Tech Break is brought to you by ACI Learning. The training industry's completion rate is barely 30%. ACI Learning blows its competitors away with an over 80% completion rate. Don't settle for subpar boring training. This is what IT pros want. Fill out the form at go.acilearning.com slash twit for more information on a free two-week training trial for your team. 